I'm not actually crapping on the serious atheists. Okay. Serious atheists are a formidable intellectual movement that has a coherent worldview. Um, that like at least said, recognizes coach, there's no objective morality. Yeah. But they recognize there's no objective morality. They realize there's no such thing as free will. They realize, at which in my opinion, eliminates you from the equation. So it's self-evidently false. It falls apart. But at least they are consistent. What I can't stand, okay? And I separate it. There's serious atheism, which I respect. And then there's pop atheism, which is nothing more than a 15-year-old having a tizzy fit because he doesn't want to feel bad uh, when he does things and he, he's going through a phase. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Midnight Mormons. I'm your host, Cardin Ellis, and actually Midnight Strike Through Mormons. We don't say that anymore. I am your host, Cardin Ellis, and today I am joined in the studio via the interwebs with none other than the philosopher poet, the warrior poet and animal trapper, Jacob Hansen, who is here to defend himself from the onslaught of... Uh, commenters shall we call them that are quite angry with his uh claim that atheism is stupid and can be proved empirically he's pissed off quite a few quite a few people here and um to be honest with you he's helping them cope he's helping them quote <laughs> With the massive I'm gonna, I'm truth gonna, bomb. I'm going to do my best. I'm going to do my best. It, yeah. It's going to be hard to help them cope. They, they're, they're pretty upset. Okay. Well, first off, what was your thoughts to the, uh, uh, what were your thoughts about um, the overwhelming response to your claim that atheism is, is stupid and can be proved empirically? What was your first thoughts? So, uh, <laughs> honestly, it was all stuff I've heard before. I, I was, I was, Sadly, I was very underwhelmed by the uh, kind of typical pablum and not uh, sophisticated arguments that came that were just the same old stuff that I've heard a thousand times uh, from atheists who who don't like to take their atheism where their atheism logically leads. Oh, really? So you kind of you were just like a little bit over it, you say, huh? Yeah, I'm more, I don't know. I was hoping for better. I was hoping they'd bring some A-game material and it was all, you know, backbenchers and weak arguments and the same old stuff that, oh, you know, I got my morality from I can see why they hate you. <laughs> like, and, and by the way, it's actually really interesting that you bring this up because like as w one of the one of the dumps that we take on atheism, as you say it, um, I've, I've kind of reached a moral, f not fear, but... I really don't know how to approach approach atheism because I have such a respect for freedom of religion and atheism really has become a religion to these people where I don't know if my dunking on atheism now is should be off limits in a way that like, I don't know, dunking on <laughs> Hinduism would be or, or something else, you know, like I'm not going to go dunk on Islam, like even and, and this is real. This is really hard for a lot of like the angry uh, Exmo crowd that was like furious. We went to the Scientologists uh, visitor center that one Sunday afternoon where we want to just have fun. And we said, Hey, we'll see what's up. <laughs> you know, like I, 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 I'm aware of the worst claims. I, I, I saw, you know, Leah Remini's uh, film. I watched going clear and all sort of stuff, but, but I don't want to just storm into a visitor center and start taking a crap on all these people's beliefs because like for a lot of these people, they're sincerely held beliefs. You want to be respectful of that. Right? So, we constantly bring up on this show that ironically atheism has become a deeper cult than medieval Catholicism ever could have been. And there's more devout religious zealots in modern internet atheism than there ever was in like radical Islam or anything like that. So it kind of well, makes me wonder, like, should internet atheism be like off limits for these people? Because they have a psychosis that's deeper than like... If they were if they were as tolerant of our belief systems as other faiths a lot of the times are, yeah, you know, I'm not going after atheists like 
like crazy, you know. Yeah, but see, you're but, supposing but that two wrongs make a right, and I will. No, come no, no. I'm just saying. I'm just saying the truth is the truth, and the falsehood is the falsehood, and they're the ones out there touting their flag of religion is dead, and we're so smart, and it's all like. And I like to go right back at them and be like, here, let's. I'm just gonna take the gloves off and let's just let's just take a look at the ideas. Let's put the ideas in the arena. Let's have the battle of ideas, and you're gonna lose and because you don't have good ideas within atheism. I am I have been really surprised at how much modern, especially like ex-religious atheism is, how much of it is literally just saber rattling where the only way they get away with what they say at the Thanksgiving table is if everybody else is Christian and thinks they're turning the other cheek by not putting up with this really unthought out, well, thought out, unscientific I would, garbage. I would push back a little bit on that though. I think, so, so a couple things. First of all, I actually have, and this is, I want to differentiate this because I'm kind of putting all atheists into the same bag. I'm not actually crapping on the serious a atheists, okay? Serious atheists are a formidable intellectual movement that has a coherent worldview. Um, that like at I least said, recognizes there's no objective morality. Yeah, but they recognize there's no objective morality. They realize there's no such thing as free will. They realize, at which in my opinion, eliminates you from the equation. So it's self-evidently false. It falls apart, but at least they are consistent. What I can't stand, okay? And I separate it. There's serious atheism, which I respect. And then there's pop atheism which is nothing more than a 15 year old having a tizzy fit because he doesn't want to feel bad uh, when he does things and he, he's going through a phase. You know what I mean? <laughs> okay. Like that. But, but, but the reason why is because it's not seriously thought out. They don't take atheism to the conclusions that it naturally leads to. My biggest thing in watching this was it isn't even like me who's making the argument. It's the other serious atheists. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who would be standing next to me going, you guys are wrong. He's right. Like I can be right about where atheism goes when you, when you actually are consistent logically with its, with what its implications are, but they won't do that. And that's what bugs me. Okay. So we're going to have to respond to some of these comments uh, on your video because our <laughs> thumbs were flying and our keyboard keyboards were on fire and, you know, I thought we might as well just actually record this so it's uploadable content instead of just keyboard warrioring it on a Friday night. OK, <laughs> so um, anyway, here, let's just jump right in. Uh, the very first thing I noticed, though, and I, I think this is what all mm -hmm. uh, would all bring to the table first. You know what I'm saying is. um it was overwhelming. And yeah, we did show this meme earlier, but like, I mean, there's poor Jacob Hansen. I love that it was you that said all these things and not me, though. So they directed their ire at you, you know, but really memes do tell the truth nowadays. And I want to share a couple of these ones uh, just before we address actual individual comments. And thank you to everybody that commented. We're totally going to address everything you said uh -huh. and uh, comments made in good faith will always be responded to. Um, but this meme, I thought that you posted was pretty savage and really explained to the world that we're in right now and the bell curve of our responses. Uh, describe this graph. So it's, it's a, an IQ bell curve. Okay. So anyone understands IQ scores that there's people of different levels of sort of, let's just say intelligence, uh -huh. kind of a controversial thing, but regardless, the memes kind of making the point here that yeah, people who are really ignorant are like, you know, yeah, God is just a man in the sky. But then yeah. you have people who start to feel like they're more sophisticated and intelligent. And then they're like, well, you know, God's like a source energy thing. And then you have kind of the people that are fairly intelligent. And eventually you get to this point where it's like, oh, that's all a bunch of hocus pocus nonsense. But I'm a believer and I, and I can see how people get to that point. Okay. Especially when you look at some of the, the unsophisticated believers out there and there's a yeah. lot of them. Okay. Uh -huh. But when you actually push deeper and keep going, you begin to reacquaint yourself with like, wait a minute, this stuff actually does make a lot of sense. And then you end up at basically the same place where the, the unsophisticated believer is. And, and there's sort of that idea of that there is simplicity on the other side of complexity. All and, right. and that is, I think what, uh, See, what this 
meme sums up nicely. See, that was a really long and laborious explanation <laughs> about what the outsides of this bell curve actually mean. I just love that the inside of the bell curve is that guy in the middle saying, God isn't real. <laughs> you know, and he's like totally just, you know, totally crying about the fact that God isn't real and he's really angry. You know what I'm saying? I just zoomed in on that. Oh, that's funny. Okay, so then the next meme I thought was pretty hilarious uh, and sums up a lot of what you're saying. There's Homer Simpson getting dragged up the hill by the Sherpas of Christianity. Finally, once he makes it to the top and he wakes up, he's like, oh, look how far I claimed, and I'm not even tired. And then, of course... There's like some people that just I'm amazed at the lack of self-awareness of a lot of these people, you know, um, the whole I made this, you made this, I made this. And then, <laughs> yeah, it's like the science. So so science actually came from Christianity. And so it's like the meme, obviously, it's like Christianity gave the world science. It was the and, and this is this is a little interesting thing here. It was because Christian religion and Islam, to, to some extent, we got to give it credit where it's due. Yeah, dude, they got uh, algebra underneath their belt, bro. You don't. Yeah, have no, algebra, no, they, man. they made serious contributions. But it, there's a reason, and, and and serious historians understand this: that the why did science emerge in the Judeo-Christian and Islamic worlds, and not in earlier sort of pagan societies? And the reason why was because their religious worldview believed that the world was organized according to laws that it wasn't arbitrary. And when you believe that the universe is organized according to laws, they believe that those laws came from the great law giver and they were discoverable. And so then they set out on a religious quest to understand the laws that governed reality. And that's where science came from. All right, sick. So um, we're going to follow the science. And by follow the science, because that's just a phrase you can use whenever you want to <laughs> act like what you're saying is... is um, is uh real which is the other word <laughs> you know what i'm saying <laughs> um by follow the science i mean follow the comments here you know <laughs> and uh th these these are just absolute pure gold uh do you want to do this at random or should i just go down the list uh whatever you want i'm down for whatever okay so um you know fine you know i'm just going to take a stab i'm just going to take a stab at these and uh, the first one, oh, the first one was pretty interesting here. Um, Troy Levitt and you went at it in the comments here. Um, yeah. He seems like a nice enough dude, so we'll start out with him. This is a good, like, middle ground, you know, just like we're easing into this, right? Uh-huh. Um, says, my goodness, Jacob appears to have done only the most shallow investigation into non-religious moral philosophy to make the misrepresentation of it that he does. Okay, I always chuckle at this a little bit because anytime you say something that somebody doesn't like, they always assume that it was only a shallow inquiry. Meanwhile, you're like quoting Nietzsche, Descartes, you know, Derrida. All, you know, it's like you've read more books than the lazy learners. Yeah, but I, now, I'm, I'm just wondering, like, uh, my, my thing was kind of like, D Troy, do I know you? Like, how do you know what I've read and what I haven't? Like, like, if you want to have a serious discussion about it, like, come on down. Well, like, I'd love to get into it. It does amaze me how much atheism has childishly assumed that they're the smart ones in the room. Oh, yeah. And that you're smarter the more atheist you are. When the reality is it takes more complexity of thought and intelligence to understand and be able to recognize God, the spirit, how science and ancient religious scripture actually sit in harmony and cooperate with each other. You're not smarter if you don't believe. Well, and You're more stupid and cynical. <laughs> like, I, I don't know how else. Like, we've just gotten to a point where that's the way it has to be described in simple terms for these people. So they stop are, insinuating there, that they're smarter because they're not. There are unsophisticated believers out there. Okay. Yes. And, and, and they're all in case. No, I'm just kidding. I only said that <laughs> just because it's a cool sounding name. Now I've got like 15 people with loaded guns actually coming to storm the castle. But anyway, I'm just kidding. Keep going. But yeah, you, you, I, I do get where they kind of, you know, we all have the religious people that say things that we all cringe at, right? I mean, yeah. they do exist, but to, to extrapolate out that, that that means that all believers are these simple-minded people is not the case. And that's what's really interesting is when you actually look at the serious case for belief. And 
And people who say there isn't a serious case for belief are just idiots who don't understand that some of the greatest thinkers of all time have been religious people. So okay, name to just some throw everyone under the, the bus comments. they're all ignorant rubes is just stupid. Name some before we dive into the comments. Uh, name people like smart people that are believers. Yeah. Well, some of the great scientists of our of our era. Yeah, um, Irene. Had, Irene's had been, one of the tops of my list. Yeah. Uh, well, like well, I was saying literally when he was asked by a reporter, like, what's it, what's uh -huh. it feel like to be the smartest man in the world? Said, I don't know. Go ask Henry Irene. <laughs> and he had a huge respect for Irene as a contemporary because he felt that he balanced the religious and the moral with like the materialistic and the um, and the, the physical. And uh -huh. of course, you know, I'm butchering the apocryphal story here. I should go out and get whatever the actual correct reference is. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but um, yeah, th this idea that like, you're smarter like, if you're more if, atheist is just foolishness. I don't care who you are. If you go and read Thomas Aquinas, you are looking at a serious, this guy, you know, was in like 1200, I think is when he lived. And, and, and his arguments are serious, intelligent arguments. Okay. And they, and, and regardless of what you think, like this guy wasn't an idiot and, and there are great philosophers um, like, like him. There's Alvin Plantinga, William Lane Craig. Uh, there are great scientists like you had on um, um, Stephen Meyer, who I really admire, but there, and he has much people around him. But one of the ones that he has around him, though, I think is absolutely brilliant is William Dembski, who, who's a brilliant scientist. And so, I mean, you have, th there's this, this idea that we're the smart club and you guys are all dumb, it's just ridiculous. Yeah, but there, there, it, it does bring up, we haven't even given Troy Levitt his due diligence yet, so we're being like wildly hypocritical when accusing <laughs> him of calling us shallow, and then we only do like the one sentence of his comment before we start shredding into memes. So, so the guy operated in good faith, and he's also a chill dude in the comments, so we'll give him uh, his... Uh, his credit where credit is due, but I do have to bring up that this this did remind me of a meme uh, that that was floating around for a while. It says, "Oh, you should let blank," and they insert some Christian uh, phraseology there that you know serves their purpose because Jesus said to be compassionate in the Bible somewhere. No, I'm not a Christian. I have nothing but contempt for your backwards religious beliefs. So yeah, this argument wouldn't work on me, but maybe if I use it on you, you do what I want. There's always this like, you know, unfair battleground where it's like, you can't push it back in my face that I'm wrong if you're Christian or else you're not yeah. being Christian. You know what I'm saying? Definitely. But oh, Definitely. we're the smart ones and you can't insinuate that you're smart or else you're not being Christian. So anyway, um, we're basically going to break Christian rules here, as well as, I don't know, <laughs> probably some social norms, and just dive straight into all of these uh, uh, comments here. So here yeah, we Troy, have let's go to, Troy had a little bit more in that comment. There yeah, was no, part I'm, that I'm, I'm to... switching over to it right now. So he says, oh my goodness, Jacob appears to have only done the most shallow investigation into non-religious moral philosophy to make the misrepresentation of it that he does. So much so that it seems dishonest to me, actually. Ouch. So he's accusing you of dishonesty already, bro. He may need to repent of bearing false witness. Oh, there it is. There it is. Insert Christian more. You know what I'm saying? Or uh, Christian moral. Right there. <laughs> he may need to repent of bearing false witness. At a minimum, he needs, he seems like a lazy learner regarding what atheists slash secularists believe. Okay, now I get it. He's being ironic. This is funny. Uh, <laughs> it's actually pretty easy to sketch out a religion free moral framework despite the insistence that it is impossible. Oh, wow. So he's taking on your challenge that in atheism there is no objective reality and he's going to do it. So here we go. Objective morality. Yeah. So he says, here, I'll do it off the cuff right now. Evolution has equipped us with moral instincts that express themselves as emotions. These instincts provide us with a built-in sense of right and wrong as it relates to our social interactions. Hence, do unto others as you would have them do unto you isn't an original idea. Rather, it's a statement derived from observation of being human that long predates Christianity. What say you, Jacob Hansen? Are all of our emotions just a bunch of moral instincts? And did evolution give us the golden rule or was it Jesus Christ? What say you, my friend? So to Troy, I would ask the question um, of, well, first of all, he needs to clarify what he means by morality. Okay. Morality isn't just someone's opinion about what's right and wrong. Okay. That's just a preference. There's a difference between a preference and a moral. A moral implies that a person has an obligation, uh, a moral duty to 
uh, do or not do some particular act. And what Troy has failed to do is to provide any reason that we have to, we, ha we have some sort of obligation to align with our uh, animal urges and instincts that were given to us by evolution. Because at the end of the day, evolution is just the blind forces of nature. Why am I morally obligated to respect the blind forces of nature that I arbitrarily have had imposed on me? by nature it's not like like i have all sorts of things that i've been given by nature and i don't do them because they're wrong so appealing to evolution and to that we got these from nature as if then we have to respect that again there he what he's missed is a thing that that, that hume pointed out a long time ago you cannot derive an ought from an is you cannot derive a should an ought from just the nature of reality. You can't say, well, evolution gave us this, therefore you ought to do X. He's stating the way things are, but then he's failing to recognize that doesn't say anything about what you ought to do. And morality is all about what you ought or ought not do. Well, and, and also constantly bragging about how survival of the fittest has molded what we have become evolutionarily. Really, unless, I mean, there is some arguments that you can get empathetic responses from this idea that only through herd immunity or through herd uh, mentality that, that that you can survive. But the truth is, you can't say all hail survival of the fittest as a creationary force and then not admit that very rudimentary and brutal survival mechanisms such as killing competition. Like yeah. if you if you want to say that you know, and they always say, oh, so so without religion, you, you would just be around killing people. And I'm like, no, no, I just have eyes and can observe the natural world. Both you and I in two different states have animal trapping licenses. And uh -huh. raccoons, male raccoons will sniff out a female and be like, okay, cool. So here's the female's nest. I'm going to go kill her babies mm -hmm. so that she's no longer worried about, you know, taking care of that young. And by the way, that's my competition's genes out there. I want more of my genes, the tougher male raccoons genes. So I'm going to go murder their babies. And then I can't even say it on YouTube what I'm going to do <laughs> to the female <laughs> raccoon. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and that's all good because I am the fittest and the survival of my species relies on me, the fittest, the toughest, the smartest, the fastest through this violence and immorality spreading my genes. So it's like you, you can't say all hail survival of the fittest and then it's, say warmth and empathy comes from it because no, I've studied raccoons. You know, and of course no, they're going to clip you're that. Right. And, and raccoons and, to Cardinalis is going to be like lobsters to Jordan Peterson. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But anyway, keep going, bro. No, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. It's, it's what's known as the naturalistic fallacy. It's the idea that because something is natural, therefore it is good. And that's Dude, absurd. so I just quoted straight up philosophy, the naturalistic fallacy. Yeah, it might be called the natural fallacy, something like that. But he also commits another fallacy. <laughs> that's another a lot better than the natural phallus. <laughs> 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 that is so immature. Uh, there's so many jokes I want to make right now, but this is a live stream, so I got to be careful. <laughs> the uh, No, we're, we're recording this one. Oh, nice, nice. Well, yeah, this is going to be released I'll, Maybe later. I'll be more aggressive with my jokes. You have a, <laughs> actually, what's ironic is I think in uh, I think in live streams you can actually be a little bit faster and looser. But anyway, okay. So he keeps going and uh, claims that yeah, okay. You know, so so he well, real quick something he said there, and other people brought this up as well. So I want to address it. There's this idea: well, morals didn't come from Christianity. Christianity didn't invent "do unto others as you'd have do unto you." And here's the thing. Yeah, no, duh. I know that. Like, I'm not saying it's true because it's Christian. I'm saying what's true is true. And then Christianity helped spread the truth, right? It isn't, I'm not saying, you see the difference there? Christianity yeah. has helped to spread the truth about morality more than any other force in the world by far. That's just historical fact. The morals that you embrace today, if you find out where they came from, if you believe that there are moral truths, that there are actually things that are right and wrong, no matter what, time, place, culture, 
whatever you want to say, if you believe in moral truth, you have to ask, well, who has been spreading it? We never claim that we have, that Christians don't claim that they're the only ones who have the truth. They just say that we, we have been trying to spread the truth and we want people to spread the truth. At least in our faith, if it's true, we believe it. Dude, awesome. Okay, so um, we're going to keep helping all of these atheists cope with uh, the bomb you just dropped in their life by uh, walking them through the silliness of their own comments here. Okay, so um, let's move on to the next one. Here we've got uh, Nary Productions. Hail Satan. (laughs) I I actually really like like that that one. Because I'm all about just funny non sequitur trolls, you know, <laughs> that one was actually just funny. And uh, Home Slice, love this guy's freaking, love this guy's <laughs> avatar. Like, what's up, Home Slice? Um, and he says the following, if a troll were to breed with the Dunning-Kruger effect, the result would be this video. <laughs> Dog, for an audience that doesn't know what it is, what's the Dunning-Kruger effect, man? So the Dunning-Kruger effect is the idea that when you start to get when you start to get familiar with something and you start to learn things, you immediately think you're like an expert in it, right? And so people who really don't know a lot about something but know a little bit, all of a sudden get way too big for their britches and they start pontificating about things that they really don't know that much about. And the idea is eventually people, if they continue, they they, they start to realize that They don't actually know as much as they do. Then they feel really stupid. And then slowly they actually gain genuine knowledge over time. So uh, the the implication here is that I know a little bit about these things, but I don't know a lot. And so I'm I'm acting too big for my britches. Is it possible that all of the atheistic, um, is it possible that all of these atheists mentioning the Dunning-Kruger effect is in itself the Dunning-Kruger effect happening in real time? It could be. I, I don't, Here's the thing. At the end of the day, the Dunning-Kruger effect is a way to say, hey, I think you're stupid and you don't really know what you're talking about. And the whole thing is, is like, well, fine. Then tell me, like, you're just name calling, bro. Like, why don't you actually bring up an argument and explain why I'm wrong? And then we'll take the comment in this and we'll totally destroy it. Okay. So <laughs> um, I like your total jock mentality. Like, yeah, bring it, bro. We'll totally destroy it, man, you know? So anyway, um, here we go. Let's go on to the next one. Uh, Oh, my gosh. So is the only reason... Okay, by the way, whenever a comment starts out with so or... That's just short for the woman on the purple screen that was interviewing Jordan Peterson. was like, so what you're saying is, (laughs) you know... You really think people should be whipped and chained and women should be imprisoned, right? You know, Mm -hmm. whenever they say so, you always know a completely uh, in bad faith argument is coming. But anyway, so is the only reason you're no killing kids, I believe you meant to say not. So is the only reason you're not killing kids because you believe to be punished for it or going to hell? So we're going to have to work through the grammar a little bit on that, but I think we know what he's trying to say. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a very so, common response. Address the common response. It, it's a very common response, and it's an absolutely ridiculous response. Okay. Well, why? Um, if it's the, if it's the, if it's ridiculous, it should be easy to debunk in one sentence, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, we no. have to be subject to our own rules. <laughs> so keep going. <laughs> so so this is the argument that oh well well you'd be out doing all these terrible things if if. Uh, if you didn't believe in God, right? And that God is the only thing, and that's pretty pathetic. Like, you must be a monster inside. It's sort of saying that that if you think that people are, the only thing holding people back from being monsters is religion, you're crazy, right? And no, I think there is something to be said for herd instinct and all that kind of stuff. But the problem is that doesn't answer the question at the end of the day. That doesn't provide an actual basis for morality. What people actually will do, and whether they have a rational basis for it, are two separate questions, right? I believe that they are acting the way that they do because they do have those instincts and and, and they do have certain things, but but that doesn't rationally justify it. Well, so, also being and, observant 
is the basis of the scientific method using repeated observations. And here's a repeated observation of human history. The 20th century killed more people than any century in world history. And what else was happening in the 20th century? We became wildly atheistic. And the 21st century is on par for being just as great. So if we <laughs> notice through repetitive observation, through repeated social experiences in many cross-cultural surveys, shall we call these body counts, okay, that the more atheistic you become, the more bloodthirsty, evil, dare I say murderous. You know, he talks about killing what? And I, I mean, YouTube won't even let me say the big A word. I find it ironic that an atheist that always is on this side of the political aisle, you know what I'm saying? All of a sudden has a problem with the killing of the most innocent, you know? So it, it's like if I can notice through repeated, repeated, like we should just call it the law of atheism, that the more atheistic a society gets, the more people, it's government, and through, I don't want to say support of the people, but through not fighting it or somehow being brainwashed into believing it, uh, 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 you know, th these societies have gotten worse and killed more people through atheism, yeah, and, not and, less. And, and the thing about it is, if you do get rid of God and any sense of morality that exists, then and it is just about power and survival of the fittest, like human beings have traditionally murdered one another in enormous numbers in tribal conflict. Like if you want to go down the tribal route, like that's sort of the reason I was telling them all, hey guys, why don't you all go read Nietzsche? He will tell you guys that you guys have what he calls slave morality which is a morality that's rooted in actually being the weaker ones, which is what sort of the Jews and the Christians were. And then they made those basically weakness into virtue, things like humility and turn the other cheek. And he's saying that is not the way the world, and he's right. The world has not traditionally viewed what is moral as humble and kindness and universal brotherhood. If you go and actually read about Rome and Greece and the Aztec world and the Mongol world and essentially every tribal situation, civilization in human history, what you find is that what they valued as the good was nobility, conquest, dominating your enemies. In other words, the actual natural uh, instincts of human beings competing to get their genes propagated more than their competitors, which is the natural state of things. And for all of you people out there talking about, oh, you just go kill people if you didn't have morality. Here's the thing. You'd kill people as soon as the resources get scarce. Yeah. You live in a world of such abundance that you think you're a moral person. When your kids get hungry, you will kill anyone to feed your babies. Dude. And, that and, and the thing is, is that that's what people don't realize. The people who lived in the past lived in a very different world than we do today, and they developed totally different moral systems. And so what makes you think that your moral system that you just invented, right, is any, if it is just invented, then it's any better than their morality uh, in the past. So you don't have an objective moral standard. And therefore, if there's not an objective moral standard, there's no such thing as moral truth. There's just subjective preferences. That's all there is. And, and if you, that's what serious atheists actually believe. And if you deny that, if you're trying to have this thing where, oh, well, the well-being of everyone is, is you know, that's just, you're, that's arbitrary. You're just making that up. That is not the way human history has said it, has done it. And you have no way of saying that your modern morality is any better than the ones in the past. And the other thing is you're denying like that hilarious Homer Simpson meme that the morality that you have and all this progress was built on the back of Christianity spreading moral truth. That doesn't mean we invented it, but it means that we propagated moral truths more than anyone else. And so if you embrace moral truth, you do it because of Christianity. So know where you came from. Oh, dude, savage. That was a pretty good one, bro. We're just going to end right there. So uh, no, I'm just kidding. Actually, we'll just uh, check out the last couple of these 
uh, comments here and just burn through them really fast. Um, here's another attack on you, Jacob. It's clear that none of you have actually spent any time learning about or talking to atheists slash agnostics. Yes, you definitely lack experience in your hundreds of hours of podcasting with these people and uh, discussing Oh, yeah, no, no, them. just a... Uh... Just a you know a decade of constant conversation with my atheist relatives, um, talking with random people online about it. Uh, you know, reading people like Nietzsche, uh, reading people like uh, Foucault, reading people like Hume, uh, reading people uh, like Derrida, um, th- th- like Dunning Kruger. I, I've read all the I've read all Dunning the Kruger. atheists. Harris. I've read Sam Harris. Uh, the Moral Landscape was a deeply influential work on my own uh, moral epistemology. Um, I- I've read uh, Dawkins, uh, The God Delusion. I've read Hitchens' God is Not Great. I've read stuff by Daniel Dennett. You know, like, come on, guys. You just you don't even know me, bro. Like, yeah. come at me with an argument. Don't don't sit here and and just like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. I you love it when like 1990 street fighting openers <laughs> have become your epistemological attacks upon atheism. You don't even know me, bro. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Well, if you're going to say things about me as a person, then uh-huh. then you probably should know me before you make dude this is the internet bro this is the wild wild west we don't know who you are and we will literally accuse you of the unspeakable all right so um let's keep going through the rest of these well let's finish reading the uh let's finish reading the comment it's clear that none of you have actually spent any time learning or talking to atheists slash agnostics unless y'all have decided to just go full-blown satire in your videos it's satire bro i did appreciate some pushback from brad well generally um, just like, you know, uh, Jim Bennett is friends with all of the anti-Mormons. Uh, Brad is not anti-Mormon adjacent, but he's like the gateway drug. You know what I'm saying? Into, uh, belief. Cause you know, he's, he tries to be diplomatic and people I think oftentimes confuse diplomacy with seeding philosophical ground. But anyway, mm-hmm. um, so we're not full blown satire and yeah actually it looks like uh jacob has actually spent a lot of time studying this and uh doesn't come from nowhere uh this one th- this guy was savaging you pretty hard el unico jose and i dig this i dig that um avatar he says so why do you keep calling atheism it said atheism but you know i used to troll people more for misspellings in the comments but it is hard with an iPhone, especially if you misspell once that <laughs> it like <laughs> auto fills the rest of your misspelling. So I don't know if I that's a that. Siri misspell or a him misspell. But anyway, so why do you keep calling atheism a religion? It's not. There's no dogma, no leaders, no cult. What? What? <laughs> okay. There's no dogma, no leaders, no cult. Uh <laughs> I meet atheists who never read a book written by a well-known atheist. Yeah, well, you're defining cults as only being those that are inspired by a book. You know, no, okay. Why are there a why are they atheists? They just say all the biblical theology sounds like BS. What is your response to that? That there are no dogma, no leaders, and no cult within uh, modern atheism, my friend. So what's funny is that he is technically right if you want to define atheism as merely the lack of belief in God. But the problem is, is that atheism leads to, therefore, a whole bunch of implications based on that, okay, such as the lack of moral or objective moral values and duties. Now, on the other side of that, I also You don't think it's a cult of like a top five internet, like- no, 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 it is. It is. It Modern is. self-congratulatory that, that is, atheism. That is, I call that humanism, okay? Humanism is the positive side of the belief. Atheism, if you want to be technical about it, atheism is saying what you don't believe in. So the question is, is what is this thing that they're doing that they do believe in? Well, most of these people, the pop atheists, they try and marry atheism and humanism. And that's my problem. That's what a pop atheist is. They're, they try and combine two incompatible, incoherent philosophies of atheism and humanism. Humanism maintains, for some reason, because of like literally just make it up. They say human beings have uh, inherent value and worth and all this stuff. And it's like, okay, 
I think you stole that from Christianity and it's not consistent with the atheist worldview, but the serious atheists, and these are the ones that I respect, okay, deny that. They recognize that that's just a arbitrary or at least social they say, construct. Yeah, we steal that from Christianity because it helps pop propagate our belief structure, which inherently serves us more. So I In, fully admit it. Exactly. And that's the thing they say, but then, but there's a recognition in there that the reason that they're saying it isn't because it's true, but because it serves their interest. In other words, they do it for power. In other words, morality boils down to what Nietzsche called the will to power. The, and by will to power, he doesn't mean just like political power. He means the will to get what you want, which is built into your survival mechanisms. So if you're a serious atheist, you recognize that all morality is a power game that you're playing with language to try and basically manipulate people to behave certain ways to serve your interests. Now you you might say, well, my interests are good. They're altruistic. You know, they, I want, I want everyone to benefit. And it's like, great. What if someone disagrees and is like, well, my interest is to just benefit the people that I care about and enslave all the rest. Like th they don't have any answer to that. Yeah, and it is kind of odd that in order for you to publicize and evangelize on behalf of your be new belief, atheism, you have to put it through the construct of good Christianity. Like, I'm using my atheism to defend the weak. Yes. <laughs> I'm using my atheism in order to produce more good. And <laughs> You, know what I'm saying? you all like need to go read Nietzsche's book, The Genealogy of Morals, uh, or, on the or On the Genealogy of the Morals, I think it's called. It, it, he basically breaks this down and says, look, historically speaking, that view that you're talking about is slave morality. What happened was, is originally in the world, um, who, were, what, who were the good guys? Who, who was good in the ancient world? If you actually study out the meanings of these words like he does, he's very brilliant. And he says, good was associated with like, being the hero, conquering, you know, that was the guy who was the archetype of the good. But then what happened was, is that eventually there was this thing that he calls the slave morality, which was essentially all the people who weren't heroes. They inverted it and they said, our weakness is actually a virtue. We are better than the people that are you know, really the good ones, the strong ones, the ones who survive. And so we are going to use this sort of linguistic game to say what is good is to be humble and to be meek and to turn the other cheek and not to conquer your enemies, right? And so what he's pointing out here is, and, he, and on an atheistic worldview, like, he's right. There's like, that is where it came from. That is the natural evolution of the morals. And so he became kind of a big, what essentially was a supremacist. He says, which is, that is what evolution does. You should be a supremacist. And, and ironically, all of the supremacist movements the world has ever seen, specifically ones based off of a book whose translation is my struggle, you know what I'm saying, have all been based upon that power dynamic. Nazism was built on the back of Friedrich Nietzsche's philosophy. Friedrich Nietzsche had an enormous, he was a German philosopher, and he, a lot of people say he paved the road and he blamed the Jews as the archetype of the weak, conquered people who perverted morality through Christianity into weakness is strength. Wow. So are you suggesting, it, well, I'm not suggesting because obviously Nazism was indeed, I mean, the outlawed religion. Like, I don't know how more atheistic you can get in terms of will to power and propagating your ideas than plain old just saying, okay, religion is now outlawed. We're not just mocking you with bad straw man they, arguments. They were very, they were very Machiavellian in that what they would do is if religion served their purpose, they'd use it. And if it didn't serve their purpose, then they wouldn't use it. These are ruthless power games. This is a this is a struggle for survival. It's a Hobbesian nightmare. And they said, we are the best people on earth. We are superior in every way. And we are going to propagate ourselves over the weak. And the thing is, I don't see how an atheist has an argument against that without appealing to Christian ideas. Oh, that's true. That's true. Because social Darwinism is what Darwinism leads to logically. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to keep helping these people cope with a couple of these last comments here. Um, we've got 
Young Guava, <laughs> which I think is totally awesome. Sounds like a YouTube channel for toys. But um, so Christians own the morality we have now. Yeah, I'd say that's a fair argument. No, uh, no, I would. I'm and I'm totally pushing back on that. And I'm pushing back on it for this reason. Again, Christians did not invent morality. They discovered it. Remember, truth exists independent of any of us. These aren't Western values or Christian values as if we invented them. When I say that these are Christian ideas, what I'm saying is, is that Christianity has helped to teach the truth, the moral truth, right? They okay. did not invent them. Okay. So Other me- people can, 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 you know, other cultures have taught true moral principles. Okay. And so so l- 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 let me go back and at least just finish what he said. He yeah, says, so Christians own the morality we have now, question mark. Believe because you really don't know the answer. Faith because you really can't prove your claims. Religion is conformity. <laughs> oh, religion is conformity. Jacob Hansen, go. Religion is conformity. Uh, yeah, yeah, religion is. I want to conform to moral truth. I want to love my neighbor. I want to be kind to people that are less fortunate. I want to do things that are right. Yes, I want to conform to the moral order. By the 100%. way, these guys immediately show their either ignorance or else be their geography. Because I've grown up in Los Angeles where the religious my entire life have been a minority that is only getting more minority. You know what I'm saying? Like, by the way, that was amazing grammar. It's only getting more minority. You know what I'm saying, dude? <laughs> but... um. It's a, it's a sliver of society that's only getting smaller. And this idea that I'm conforming to the majority, if I were doing that, I would be becoming more secular, more politically progressive, more CRT, more uh, feminist, more all of this other garbage, all right? I Let wouldn't me tell you, be being a, conforming being, to God. I'd be conforming to secularism. Let me tell you something. That Only makes people really... in wealthy Christian societies can say garbage like that. I've, I, I tell you what, you get really popular today by being a white Christian male Mormon. Yeah. Like that just that everyone just is like, wow, man, like you're the Give best. Give me some of that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we're going to keep helping these people cope. Uh, sorry about that one, young guava. But uh, yeah, we're just gonna we'll, we'll go to the next one. What do you think about this one, Jacob? Blue Meanie. Hey, at least they're honest about it. Although I think it's the guitar. If you look right there, um, I recognize this guy in the comments. Says uh, Jacob makes many assertions based on stereotypes of agnostics and atheists. Without the true God, there is no morality. Question mark. Okay, so the Stoics, for example, did not have a moral code. No, of course the Stoics had a moral code. Stoicism is. A code of ethics. And if you read, for example, um, The Art of Living uh, or The White Book by Epictetus, which is one of my favorite, uh, you'll notice some amazing moral truths in there that, oh my gosh, read Epictetus on avoiding casual uh, romantic relations, shall we say. And it literally sounds like a conference talk from 1992 instead of a moral treatise. Uh, that's, you know, nearly two centuries old. But anyway, so the Stoics, for example, did not have moral code, question mark. By Jacob's reasoning, since they did not have Christ, they cannot justify their code. Yet even you guys have appealed to Stoic ideals on this channel. Ooh, how do you respond to that one, Jacob Hansen? So this is where there is a need to define what people mean by morality, Okay. We're talking about what people ought and ought not do. I actually do not believe that God is a necessary grounding for moral truth. Now, people might be like, wait a minute, I thought that's what you're arguing. No, that's kind of the classical theist argument. Our argument in the church, which is actually really unique and super profound in my opinion, and it's in Alma 42, is the idea is that the moral law, what we call eternal law, exists independent of God. It's baked into the nature of reality itself. That, that, for example, matter is eternal, 
Jesus Christ was the organizer by creation. We meant the organization of the world and so on and so forth. Okay. Yes, this gets this gets a little technical. It is my bit. judgment. Eternal judgment is eternal judgment because it is my judgment and I am eternal. That is what you're saying is so unique. So so this is what's what's wild is that God himself is subject to the eternal law. God actually himself is not the grounding, but the eternal law is the grounding of morality. Okay. And it well, exists co eternally with the Father, in my opinion. We talked about this with McConkie's nephew, who was my institute teacher in New York, specifically about is God subject to the law? Well, if he is the creator of the law, he is subject to it while being able to change it simultaneously. He's not. We do not believe in divine in in uh, divine command theory, which means what God says is moral, therefore it's moral. God is actually can cease to be God, according to Alma forty two. So this is where it gets really wild. But it actually is the the divine command theory, which is the idea: if God says it's moral, it's moral, and that's the traditional theistic position. We actually reject that. And so Sam you say Harris, McConkie was wrong, dog. I would, I would want to. I'm calling I'm not him sure up right now, dude. Exactly. No, I'm just kidding. By the way, I might have totally just absolutely misquoted him, and he's probably <laughs> screaming at his screen right now, like "You idiot!" <laughs> you know what well, I'm no, saying? No, I'd, I'd love to discuss it. I have, but so on my blog, I'm gonna, I'm gonna point people here because I probably can't get through it because it's, a, it's a fairly meaty topic. But I have a, a blog on thoughtful-faith.com. If you go to the blog called "Objective Morality and Suffering: The Gravitational Force of Being." This is a, a, an article that I wrote where I kind of break down our basis of, of objective moral values and duties, and it's very similar to what Sam Harris talks about. I'll, I've, uh, all you atheists who don't think I ever read or understand anything about atheists, I think Sam Harris got the closest anyone has ever got to actually grounding objective moral values and duties, and he did it within the nature of being itself, but there's, there's a lot to it where where he still fails in the end to be able to ground it. Um, and that's kind of a long story that I cover in that blog, but okay. Uh, so, the, so thoughtful dash faith, um, maybe blue meanie needs to go there, you know? Um, but so does everybody else. Solid plug. Let's go on to the next one really fast. We only got three more left, bro. And then we'll be done. Yeah. Um, he continues to say, and the normative nature of moral statements arises from the fact that we are all sentient beings who actually deliberate on how our actions impact the well-being of other sentient and non-sentient creatures and can empathize with how those other creatures are impacted from our actions, which can inform us on whether or not it cultivates or tears down that other being's well-being. So just as Troy Levitt said that, hey, our emotions are evolutionary responses that have helped breed empathy. And naturally, we all just love each other instead of being like raccoons who go out and slaughter everything to make sure that their genes actually propagate. That we are sentient beings who actively deliberate on how our actions impact the well-being of other sentient and non-sentient creatures. What do you say to that, Jacob Hansen? Go. Okay. This is actually a great comment. And I'm going to explain why. Oh, Blue I actually Meanie! Think he's, Blue Meanie got it! <laughs> he, 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 he's on to something here. And he's on to something really good. And it, it seems that he's read Sam Harris's The Moral Landscape because this is what Sam Harris talks about in that book. And the idea is this. What is morality ultimately? We're talking about what someone ought to do or ought not do. So, Cardin, if, if you wanted to go to San Diego, I might say you ought to go south on the, the I-5 freeway. Right? Okay? okay. So the ought, the concept of the ought of what people ought to do is based on where they want to go. Right? Can we agree there? Yeah. Okay. If you don't have somewhere to go, then, or you're not trying to get to some goal, then the ought kind of loses its, its orientation, its meaning. When we talk in morality about the ought, what we're actually talking about is that we assume that everyone has the goal of their own well-being. We don't assume that you want to self-sabotage. And so I will say, Cardin, you ought to do X. Why? Because it will lead you closer to well-being or it will lead you farther away from suffering. And that's a valid way of, of, of that. I think that describes what we're saying when we use moral language. When I say someone ought or ought not do something, I am describing something that affects the well-being of another person. Okay. 
And I'm speaking to you because I assume that you want your own well-being and therefore you ought to do this because I am assuming that you want to to move away from suffering and towards well-being, right? Like you ought to eat right, Cardin. You ought to be nice to your wife. You ought to, you know, you ought to interact well with all of us because that promotes well-being. That's kind of the argument here. Okay. Okay. So now, oh, sorry, keep going. So this is where it gets a little tricky though. Okay. And this is where Sam Harris misses. Whose well-being takes priority? He doesn't address that. He just, they kind of put it out there in the ether of like well-being of whose well-being? The well-being of the individual or of the collective? And the only reason why these arguments end up holding any water to the average modern American reader or fighter in our comment section is because they're so conditioned to a general Judeo-Christian worldview and that kind of linguistic uh, formation of an argument, okay, mm-hmm. that they, they, they it, it carries water in their minds. But I'm going to go back to his original comment here and, and give you what my response was, okay? That... If we're going to assume here, you know, he says, without true God, there's no morality. So the Stoics, for example, did not, did not have a moral code. By Jacob's uh, reasoning, since they did not have Christ, cannot justify their code. Yet even you guys appealed to Stoic ideals in this channel. Yes, I would agree that you with you that like, okay, truth predates even Christianity if it is indeed truth, right? But the normative nature of moral statements arises from the fact that we are sentient beings who actively deliberate on how our actions impact the well-being of other sentient, non-sentient creatures. No, I'm sorry. Genghis Khan was not riding on his horse through (laughs) Asia, okay, pillaging and R-A-P-I-N-G-ing everybody to such a degree that like one out of every 14 Asians can genetically trace their lineage back to him now in See, the but, modern but, but day. Real, real quick, let me, let me push back. He would probably say this, but we can say that he was wrong because he was harming the well-being of other Look, people. Look, I, I, I'm sorry. To me, for you to say that all of us are just like so naturally good people that empathize because like evolution has made us super empathetic. I'm like, I'm sorry, soy boy, but like only in literally a spoiled rotten and spoiled by who Christian, (laughs) you know, (laughs) suburbanism slash Western Judeo Christian values for such a long time. Only a society so spoiled by Christianity for such a long time that they forgot what it was like outside of the gates before they built them. Just like an attack on Titan. The, The gates had been up for so long that were protecting them from the Titans. The inside, they stopped believing that the Titans even existed. Okay, it's only in the most spoiled societies so removed from the struggle of people that had to interact in a non Judeo Christian society that you can literally think, oh, like when we're on autopilot, we're just like all so beautiful. Like, and, oh, my gosh. <laughs> Yeah, like, no, our, our, our prosperity has definitely led us to not have to face moral conundrums that other people had to deal with. But going back real quick to that philosophy on that, that they you he would probably say, look, Genghis Khan was wrong because he was hurting other people. But the thing was, is it wasn't hurting Genghis Khan's well-being. For Genghis Khan, he was like, I'm going to go kill everybody and enslave them, and that will increase my well-being. And so the thing is, is well, then why shouldn't he do that? And that's the problem that Sam Harris and these people don't get when they just talk about well-being in the ether. Because ultimately, you know whose well-being you, you, you actually care about? You care about your own. And what happens is, is that what you will end up doing in that sort of a morality is that your well-being becomes paramount. So if your children contribute to your well-being, well, then, what, then having them and taking care of them is moral. But if they're not, well, then you just hurt them and kill them. The, the idea that you have some sort of an obligation to other people, even if that in no way benefits you, is a total take from Christianity. Yeah. It's... That, that, that does not work in that philosophy of whose well-being is ultimate, because ultimately the well-being that matters most to you is your own. And the rational thing to do, the most rational thing to do, if well-being is, is ultimate, 
your well-being is ultimate. Because if you're going to say that the collective or that other people's well-being is is actually takes priority over yours, well, then what that means is that you have no rights because it's the collective that ultimately matters. And if you have to die for the good of the group, well, then you die. And so they can't reconcile that problem, but Christianity can because Christianity posits that all of our well-being is actually 100% interrelated because if you do harm to other people you'll eventually pay for it well, and so and it also actually the, harms the your well-being of an eternal, harm other people. the concept of the world people don't realize how profound like the fact that the church of jesus christ has made the most translated children's song in the world i am a child of god is a wildly historically revolutionary thing Mm -hmm. All of these ideas, even that the collective matters, really comes from this Christian ideal that, okay, of all of the titles God, the most omnipotent um, uh, uh, being on earth, has chosen to take is the identifier that I am, meaning I exist— I think therefore I am, you know what I'm saying, that, that, that I am not determinist, that we, are, we, we have agency and we exist because of independent thought and agency. And if I'm going to convert that essence into a title, the title I choose, of all the titles on earth that he could choose, from general to emperor to commander to whatever, he chooses father. That inherently insinuates a family dynamic, a communal dynamic that is a building block of civilization, you know, halfway in between the full communal and the full individual, but the family. So, so all that is wildly different than the natural and the historical world around us. Okay. Yes. So we're going to help finishing, uh, help finish these, uh, people to cope. Um, Blue Meanie, you get you get the I, I guess you get the Jacob Hansen Award for the uh, <laughs> the the best comment of the day. Um, but here's the last two right here. El Unico Jose is back. He says, so you want atheists to believe in magic, ghost demons, the devil, a dude that died, came back to life after two days. The Garden of Eden is in the United States and joined a cult started by a convicted charlatan who had multiple wives, all without evidence, all of it without any evidence, man. And call them dumb if they don't believe. I don't know what to tell you, dude. Crying emoji face. What do you say about that one, Jacob? So um, I, I'm kind of shocked. I've never heard those things before. And I guess, I guess my question though is, is, is so he provided the basis for morality and his worldview where? Yeah, that was just a big cruel straw man. But I guess that's yeah. You can you can just you can. Here's the thing: you can just throw mud at people and be like, "You're all wrong," and that. Or you can actually engage the argument. And here's the thing: like, I'm I'll crap on atheists, but I'm gonna like drop a an argument bomb on you. I'm not gonna just sit there and call you names. I may drop a little bit of names here and there. But so so you are suggesting (laughs) that El Unico Jose on your graph of um the intelligence level of arguments is not in the middle crying that God isn't real, isn't in the bottom of the bell curve saying God is like source energy, but is right here on the left saying God is the man in the sky. Yeah. I think he's probably at that level. And here's the thing. He's probably interacted with some people that are on that level. And uh, yeah, there are some people like that. Oh, so you're giving him the benefit of the doubt. That is so Christian and good of you. I know, right? He probably <laughs> acted with bad actors on your side of the fence as well. How, how benevolent. It's almost as though you're treating him as a brother, <laughs> which would insinuate that we're all children of God and, and deserve that basic decency. Yeah. Oh, way I, I could to go lead Genghis with your best foot forward, Jacob. This is why you and Brad are going to be apostles 2028. So anyway, um, here we go. With the last one right here. I hope it's good. Cygnus says, but the Bible has people doing drastically immoral behavior in the name of God. How can we sit and say that atheism has no moral objectivity when God in the Bible has commanded people to do things that would terrify us and make us question our own morality today? Ooh, what about that one, Jacob? So morality, what is, what does he mean by that? Like, where did this guy come to the conclusion that there's any such thing as right or wrong behavior? 
and and that like other that people are actually obligated to to behave his comment again it implies moral truth that there are right and wrong answers to moral questions that there are things that are actually right and actually wrong and he's saying your god has violated this standard of morality and i look at him and i go what standard are you talking about you just are making it up oh well it's the you know what his standard is it's the generally accepted customs of a western suburban american culture in the year 2022 and it has no not even it has nothing to do with the vast majority of human history yeah, and society. Again, for me, this is just the fulfillment of that meme. If we go back to that original meme that we showed earlier on, where there was the guy who literally said, like, I have nothing but contempt contempt for your Bible and your moral framework, but I will use it against you in an argument if it's going to make me, you know, win the argument. This meme right here, you know, <laughs> you should blank. Easy. You know what I'm saying? Because Jesus said to be compassionate in the Bible somewhere. No, I'm not a Christian. I have nothing but contempt for your backwards religious beliefs. But this argument work, wouldn't work on me. But if I use it on you, you'll do what I want. You know, I look at that as literally no different than this comment right here where he says, you know, but in the Bible, it says to do morally horrible stuff. Quote, how can we sit and say that atheism has no moral objectivity when God in the Bible has commanded people to do things that would terrify us and make us question our own morality? So, well, that's a bunch of, to me, straw mans. Like, there, and there's the top three. The, oh, well, the Bible justifies slavery. No, when the Apostle Paul mentions slavery, it's actually in the return of a slave during the Roman Empire when see, slaves but, who but ran Cardin, could have been killed. There, and he was actually pleading for the man's life when he said that he should submit as a slave. He wasn't trying to argue for the morality of slavery. He was trying to preserve the life of a Christian convert slave who was guilty of a death sentence, you know, and, and, and oh, well, what about the genocide of, 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 of Jacob? Yeah. Only if you literally believe that the Nephilim, a race of 10 to 15 foot giants that survived the flood and interbred with the sons of man and lived in Canaan you know, if you actually study the genocide of Aaron, you know, in Cain, it's of a bunch of mythical non-humans. So, so if you want to leverage the morality of the genocide of Aaron against the people in Canaan, you would have to simultaneously admit that giants are real. You know, so it's like it's only if you have the most simpleton uh, not understanding the actual story of the Bible arguments, do you come out and say that, wow, God in the Bible has commanded people to do things that would terrify us nowadays? Okay, I'm sorry, I don't see any modern prophets, prophets commanding us to wage war and genocide on mythical creatures. Okay, so... Yeah. I so and and there's there's another deeper point here, and C.S. Lewis nails it. Every, and this guy obviously has not read mere Christianity, or if he did, he didn't understand what it's saying. And so I'm going to read a, a little quote here, if, if I could. It's it's a little bit longer, but it's it's really good. And I think it just basically take us it home. Says exactly this will be what the I've final, bro. Okay, so C.S. Lewis said this. He said, "When you think about these differences between the morality of one people and another, do you think that the morality of one people is ever better or worse than that of another? Have any of the changes been improvements?" If not, then of course, there could never be any moral progress. Progress means not just changing, but changing for the better. If no set of moral ideas were truer or better than another, there would be no sense in preferring civilized morality to savage morality, or Christian morality to Nazi morality. In fact, of course, we all do believe that some moralities are better than others. We do believe that some people who tried to change the moral ideas of their own age were what we called reformers or pioneers, people who understood a morality better than their neighbors did. Very well then. The moment you say that one set of moral ideas can be better than another, you are in fact measuring them both by a standard, saying that one of them conforms to that standard more nearly than the other. But the standard that measures the two things is something different from either. You are, in fact, comparing them both with some real morality, admitting that there is such a thing uh, as a real right, independent of what people think.
and that some people's ideas get nearer to the real right than others. Or put in this way, uh, if your moral ideas can be truer than those of the not are uh, and those of the Nazis less true, there must be something there must be something, some real morality for them to be true about. The reason why your idea of New York can be tr truer or less true than mine is of New York is because New York is a real place, existing quite apart from what either of us thinks. When each of us said that New York, when each of us said New York, each of us means merely the town I am imagining, or I'm sorry, it says if when each of us said New York, each of us were merely imagining a town in our own head, how could one of us have a truer idea about New York than the other? There would be no question of truth or falsehood at all. In the same way, if the rule of decent behavior meant simply whatever each nation happens to approve, yeah. there would be no sense in saying that any one nation ever had been more correct in its approval than uh, in its approval than any other. No sense in saying that the world could ever grow morally better or morally worse. Rock on. All right. Well, you pretty much just said it right there, dog. So um, I think we covered all, all, you know, parts of that bell curve that we shared before. <laughs> Um, you said Blue Meanie was on the the high end outskirts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he he he's someone who it appears to me has read Sam Harris as the moral landscape because that language that he used and the idea of well being is an idea promoted very heavily by Sam Harris. So all of you guys who don't think that I know anything about what atheists actually say or or that um yeah, just keep in mind I, I know what I'm talking about. Yeah, so so it looks like we got the troglodyte arguments saying, oh, so, so you think <laughs> over here at the bottom, but then there was blue meanie over here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm going to set up a debate between you two. No, I'm Let's just do it. I'm just, I'd love to, I'd love to do that. <laughs> you know, and, and just so everyone knows open invitation. If you guys really think I'm wrong, reach out to me, uh, thoughtful faith, 2020 at gmail.com. If you want to talk to me more about some of this stuff, maybe get on my, my show, we can discuss it. I'm super fascinated with the nature of, of ethics and morality and trying to ground them. Um, it's a subject that I've been studying for years and years and no, uh, you haven't. You like, obviously through your <laughs> ignorance and your Dunning Kruger nonsense, like don't even know, bro. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, and this is the other thing. Remember, I have great respect for serious atheists. I have great respect for people who actually think deeply about this. But here's the problem, guys. I'm sorry. Pretty much all the big serious atheists all are at the same conclusion. And their conclusion is there is no such thing as objective morality. It's all just power dynamics and, and will to power. And they admit that. So and then go I read John Gray. Sad, He'll though. tell you more about if it. If you're a real atheist, I kind of feel sad for those guys, though, because if you're a real atheist that has come to the conclusion that really it, it is all just about a will to power. There's no objective reality. And, and you're truly released from that anchor of morality. And you're not out there just living it up, balling it up, getting in bar fights and not feeling bad for it. Killing the people that piss you off and not feeling bad for it. You know, pillaging, stealing, raping. Like, I just like, if you're not living like a mother freaking Viking, you know what I'm saying? And like straight up, like just soy boying it in a library with a laptop sipping a latte as you talk about how like there's no objective morality. Like, I'm sorry, you need to be mother freaking Genghis Khan. All right. If you're out there believing that there's no straight up morality or else I just think you are the most unactualized, like so far from who you think you should be. It must be eating you alive. You know what I'm saying? Like, is it's, that making I, sense? I, I rarely meet people who actually, who I think actually believe in their serious atheism because 
very people's beliefs you can see what they believe by the way they behave you would inherently have to be a pansy if you literally believe there's no objective morality for why i shouldn't just engage in mutual combat with people that piss me off because i'm bigger than them if you if you really think that there's that's not morally wrong the fact that you're not doing that when people piss you off shows that it's just because you're a big fat pansy <laughs> like I mean, am i wrong well, I would say I would say this. The the reason they don't, if if someone was being consistent, I'm not saying that because I I really think that they they just deeply intuit that it's wrong to hurt people and do that kind of stuff. And I think that that's that actually is part of who you are as a human being. And I believe that's the light of Christ. Again, you have to get into religious appeals. But if someone was to take that actually seriously, the reason they won't do it is because also you get in, like it will affect your well being negatively if you go around beating people up and doing things. There is a practical side to trying to cooperate in a group. But that people take that and they're like, oh, well, that's where morality is. That's what it is. But they don't understand that on a bigger scale, like that doesn't hold up. Like, yeah. why don't we just go conquer all the nations? I don't know, dude. Us, I could go then, out right now and I could slash 15 neighbors' tires that bother and me and get away with it and get away with it so like if so i that's, really that's th the thing yeah no and 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 you are right if if you can this is the crazy thing and there's a great book uh dostoevsky's crime and punishment is all about this the idea in the book is that you can't ever get away with it you you never get away with it and that's a christian idea because i can tell you right now if there's no god there's a lot of things i could get away with and then it's not really a calculation of is it right or wrong. The only calculation is can I get away with it? Yeah. Because if you can get away with it, and like, like for instance, if I can cheat on, you know, if someone can cheat on their spouse, and they can get away with it, well, in the in the well being analysis, you have a higher well level of well being because you're getting what you want. The person that you're cheating on uh, your spouse with is getting what they want, and your spouse is none the wiser. So at the end of the day, everyone's better off. All right. His name is Jacob Hansen. His website is thoughtful-faith.com. And he'll help you cope if you call upon him to argue your atheism. This is Midnight Mormons. See you guys on the next podcast. Oh, oh, oh.